so I'll need to. So Chris, thanks a lot for asking me to participate. I actually sent Chris some uh, smart, smart alecky ideas about all the things we could do with arts, and he said, "Well, come and be a panelist and, and talk to us." So thank you, and Robert, thank you for that really great introduction. And what I just want to make a point is Stella actually has been working on the well, I think uh, on the on the environmental side on the on building making buildings greener and natural other other issues connected to the environment so she's kind of moving it coming into it a little bit from a little different perspective than um, yeah. Robert so that's I thought yeah. it might be a nice mix of folks yeah thanks appreciate that um, I actually I'm an urban planner by training and for the last 10 or 15 years I've been working in policy around green buildings and sustainability um, but my great love really is nature and the arts and back when I got out of school, I moved to New York City and I just walked into the Metropolitan Museum of Art and said, I think this is where I'd rather work than in a policy office. So I did community education on the arts, just really on a kind of a, a just luck walking in at the right time uh, and really had a great experience. And then worked in an art magazine around public art and public space. So it's it's been this kind of... Uh, pull of the heart for me between environment and the arts. And I'm so glad that we're starting this conversation about um, how we can actually work those two together. Because I think they're vital to each other in some ways that I'm going to uh, talk to you about. And that's enough about me. I, I, I want to talk about, a little bit about the dialogue that I think happens between art making and nature and some of the creative potential in that arena. And so it's a truism, but let me say it, that humans and nature have been in dialogue since the beginning of time. It's just, it's, we can't avoid it. We are human, we are part of nature, and we make things. So everything we create and build is a design decision. So the, you could say this are making in everything we do, and everything we make has its origins in nature. So it's an unavoidable dialogue. And you've seen some of the exuberance of that dialogue and also some of the kind of unexpected effects. So human art and nature interact in some very specific ways that I think lends itself to this conversation. And so I'm going to go to that aspect of the conversation. And I don't know why I ended up on this slide again. Could I say next? Yeah, absolutely. Would, you, would you help me out? No troubles. I can't read. Um, so behind me, no, wait a minute. Is it the same? Actually, this is the one. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, it looked too wild. I'm like, we can't be in the park. This is somewhere else. So behind us is Dumbarton Oaks Park, and I'm on the board of this organization uh, because I love nature and I love good design. And, um, and there are some lessons that, that are to be drawn, I think, from this particular park experience. So one of them is that um, nature and the environment actually inspire us to make art. So I think that's one part of it. We are inspired by nature to create. And here in Dumbarton Oaks Park, um, and I guess we can go, we can go next. You can, you can walk in Dumbarton Oaks Park, which is off of R Street in Georgetown. And if you go there often enough, you're going to run into a venerable Japanese gentleman who, once a week, with his elderly wife behind him, walks the paths and breaks out into song, in Japanese. Really? And he does this as a ritual in the park. Uh, and it's his way of, of uh, singing to the world, and he does it in this very special place. Or if you go there often enough, you'll see guitarists who take musicians, uh, particularly one, one person who goes and sits on a bench over there and just makes music in the park. That that particular place, being in contact with nature, inspires people to do that. And I was talking to Steve from uh, Parks and People. Steve. Coleman. Coleman. Thank you. Everybody knows him. Washington Parks and People. Yes. Uh, Parks and People. And he was telling me that in the 80s and 90s, artists used to make gorilla art in the park, that they would take invasive vines, and suddenly in the middle of the meadow would appear this created piece of something, <laughs> which of course was totally illegal, and God forbid I would say you should ever try it again. Um, but it was a wonderful way to experience the park. Um, and um, if there's a way for us to actually start pulling the invasives, the, the, the thick vines off of the trees, mm -hmm. and use them for art, I think it would be fabulous. We just have to get the Park Service to agree to, uh, to let us do that. <laughs> they want to destroy it immediately. That's why we have guerrilla art. Not that I would advise any of you to do that. Um, and if you go to the next slide. So, um, uh, Dio, Dunbar Knox Park is actually a designed landscape. And that's the funny thing about it. You go in there and you think you're lost in the wilderness. But it was designed by a woman named Beatrix Ferrand, who was the country's first woman landscape architect. 
And she, kind of in the tradition of Olmsted and others, knew how to relate to the land in such a way that her design felt like it had always been there. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you go there, you have this illusion of being in a wild place. But in fact, there are certain places you look, and above it is John Barton Oaks Park Estate, which many of you probably know, very formal gardens. And below, like this way over here where we are in, in, the, in the public part of the park, um, is this kind of bucolic, bucolic landscape. So she actually made the landscape itself kind of an expression of art making, which I think is important to remember that landscape design is probably one of the first forms of art making in relation to, in relation to nature. And one more bit about our park, which is kind of my reference point now. Robert and Mildred Bliss, who were the owners of the original estate, commissioned Stravinsky to write a concerto for Don Bartnock Spark because they were inspired by the beauty of the place. So, uh, and if you go to the next slide, thank you. In fact, the, 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 the Trump, the, the, the kind of wonderful fiction of Dunbar and Oaks Park being a wild place was so persuasive that in the middle of the century, uh, Stuart Udall, the Secretary of the Interior, Justice Douglas, and Robert Frost, and that's him there, used that park as a place to speak on behalf of the Wilderness Act, which was then languishing in Congress and they needed to get momentum going. And that was considered one of the seminal events of helping to bring the Wilderness Act, a political vehicle, into, into play again. It was approved two years later. Uh, so again, kind of the power of nature to help us do what we, what we uh, need to do. And I think we can go next, and I'll hold there for a while. So in addition to being inspired by nature to make art, I think our own art making evokes nature in certain ways. And here's what I would propose are some of the ways. So um, in music, for example, we evoke nature all the time, right? So I was walking through the park one day in the merry, merry month of May. I was taken by surprise by a pair of eyes, right? So it's this kind of you, this, this kind of free spirit and also this kind of ambivalence, like what's out there in the woods, right? What, what wild creature? Or how about as we evoke ourselves as a nation or as a people? Oh, beautiful for gracious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties. We go on and on about America the beautiful. And then, of course, we evoke God and patriotism and battles and that sort of thing. But we start by evoking nature, which I think is really worth noting. And even the poetic invocations, and I'm so glad we have a poet in the room. Um, I've, uh, the last few inaugural speeches, remember the one that Maya Angelou made? Mm -hmm. To me, it's one of the most memorable moments of poetry making in the country for, for, for President Clinton on the pulse of the morning in 1993. It starts out like this. A rock, a river, a tree, host to species long since departed, marked the mastodon, the dinosaur, who left dry tokens of their sojourn here on our planet floor. So through time, kind of evoking nature. And more recently, Richard Blanco, just a month or two ago, starts his uh, invocation with, one sun rose on us today, kindled over our shores, peeking over the Smokies, greeting the faces of the Great Lakes, spreading a simple truth across the Great Plains, then charging across the Rockies, one light, waking up rooftops under each one, a story told by our silent gestures moving behind windows. So again, you, you define yourself as Americans first within the natural landscape. Wal Whitman, Leaves of Grass, Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken in a Yellow Wood. So just thinking about sort of these very traditional ways that we, as a culture, as a people, continue to dialogue with nature. We listen to nature and we evoke it. And even you go to, uh, today to the Textile Museum, you go back a thousand years to the sultans of, of Turkey. The robes of the sultans were filled with flowers and ivy, and Chinese uh, rulers, just everything they wore was just full of the signs of nature. Nevertheless, uh, we have wreaked havoc with natural systems. And that's why I'm, I'm turning for the second half of my presentation, which- um, You have you to would, pass through a bunch yeah. of slides. To so get there, see those these stuff. are amazing slides, and we're gonna go through them because Stella didn't know how to take things off the web and put them on her PowerPoint. Okay, so we'll go back to, if you could go back to that one, yeah. 
the first, but yeah. So those showed you some of the edgier sides of art making in relation to the environment. So I'll have to evoke them with words. Um, and I'll do my best to have some show and tell. Um, so the question is, what happens when artists become activists in relation to the environment? Like, so what are the possibilities? And this is what I would propose. I propose that we need art making and culture to learn how to relate to the world in a new and different way. Robert, very much like you were saying. To be sustainable, I think we have to bring in all of our tools of culture and the arts because I don't think that the other tools can fully encapsulate what we need to do. So art, culture, and media have a power that other social vehicles simply don't have. And when you think about the work that you've done, Chris, regulations, right, we're working on those stormwater regs, good. Political diplomacy, you do that all the time. You can't not have the political diplomacy. Righteous warfare for the environment. That coal campaign is awesome, and we need to do it, right? Business partnerships, of course. And yet, each of those has its limits. There's only so far that we can do with that kind of action. And I do think it has to do with the human body and, and things that relate to that. So we actually need cultural change. We don't just need legal change. We don't need regulatory change. We actually need cultural change and a new kind of cultural and bodily awareness to assist us to collaborate, collaborate with nature in a new way. And the artists that I think have done some of the most persuasive work around this, I will, I will touch on. And there was that wonderful slide, and I'll have to describe it to you. One of my heroes is Merle Eucalys. Do any of you know her work? She was a feminist artist in the 70s, and she's alive now and still working. She became a mom in the 70s as a feminist, and she realized she was always cleaning up. She was cleaning up after other people. And then she said, you know, there are people in society whose job is always to clean up, like sanitation workers and moms. Like, everybody else does stuff, and then we get to clean up after them. I mean, this was her, you know, feminist analysis with, with many good points. So she created performative art events where she ritualized cleaning on a sidewalk, for example. And she drew this crowd, and that was the link that I'll share with you all. This is a short video that shows well, her. I'll make sure I share the links with yeah. everyone in our report. Can you, can you say and spell her name? Merle, M-I-E-R-L-E, Eucales, U-K-E-L-E-S, Eucales. And uh, with great humor, she, she had this one performance where she started cleaning a sidewalk in front of her gallery in Soho. And she attracted all these people. I said, you can't do that by yourself. That's really hard. Let me help you. And she started this, this dialogue in the public about what it means to clean up after others and after yourself. And uh, her, her project had such impact that the city of New York asked her to be the first resident artist with the sanitation department of New York. <laughs> And her first, her first major piece of art making that she became famous for was a project called Touch Sanitation, where she went out and she shook the hand in thanks of every sanitation worker in the city of New York, which was 8,500 people, with the line, thank you for keeping New York City alive. And there are these wonderful pictures, which, which I can send you links for thanking the sanitation workers of the city. And then she created a parade of sanitation trucks that went <laughs> through the city, and the workers became the heroes. And then she put mirrors on some of the sanitation trucks. Again, sort of, whose stuff is it? while well, you're looking at it, right? Fascinating work. She also worked on land uh, landfills. Uh, she worked as a, a member of a collaborative team to actually bring art and nature and healing to places like the Fresh Kills landfill, and Danahy Park, which is a place I lived in Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she created all kinds of wonderful interactive projects. I could go on, and uh, this is, uh, I edited an art magazine for a while, and um, this was our inaugural issue, and we put Merle's stuff on the cover. So I can pass this, please be careful, it's like an archival document. It's a long go. But th these were uh, a gloves from sanitation workers in the city. And then this is a little bit of her land art, and I can pass. I would say just look at the, the covers and the back. So people like, um, there's been a generation of people like Merle working around these kinds of issues. Agnes Dennis did a wonderful project in the, not in the 90s, in 1982, a while back. She planted two acres of wheat in Manhattan, in lower, in lower Manhattan, to kind of 
question the use of land in the city. And then harvesting the wheat became part of the artistic process, very body-oriented. Um, and then they've had, of course, uh, generations of artists that came up after them. And now I will skip about a generation or two of art makers and go to Faviana Rodriguez, whom you probably know. Because weren't you in that exhibit? Um, Ripple Effect. Ripple Effect was a fantastic. Have any of you seen Ripple Effect, Museum of the Americas? A surprisingly edgy show that uh, included a lot of Latin artists. Um, and I think you were one of them, yeah. and you could talk about your work. But um, I just wanted to mention um, Faviana Rodriguez, who, who has decided that the idea of borders and boundaries is kind of silly, and she takes, I'm encapsulating, she takes the monarch butterfly as an example of that, saying migration is natural and migration is beautiful, and human beings, like monarch butterflies, move across borders. And as an artist activist, she uses art making to make her point, and I'll pass this around, let me start here. And there's a wonderful set of images, again, um, which I don't have, where she puts these very large scales butterfly um, postings on walls around the city, and then people stand in front of them to show their support for free migration. And then if you don't have one of those, then she asks you to make a gesture of the monarch butterfly yeah. in front, and you show your solidarity with migrants of whatever species they are. Mm. And I think it's just you know a wonderful indication of how artists and activism can come together so I go up to Faviana at the panel at the museum, and I say, Faviana, I've been thinking about art making and environment, and I also think a lot about immigration. I, I think about the contributions that immigrants can make to our environmental conversation because they haven't really been invited to do so. And usually people look at me like, what are you talking about, Stella? Like, immigrants and sustainability and green, like, that's too complicated, you know, like, what? We have enough to think about, you know, just straight down the line, environmentalism. I say, do you have any sense, Faviana, how you can like think about immigration and sustainability in a kind of interesting way? She says, Stella, you, you are so right on. She says, nobody knows more about climate change than migrant workers. Because they're the ones who work the fields in California, and they can tell you how the weather conditions and work conditions have changed. And in fact, and she drew up another of her little, um, you know, these are very transferable things. Uh, it, it shows a migrant worker uh, who's holding a sign that says climate, si climate silence is criminal. And so she also sees possibilities of, which way, uh, of how activism, immigrant activism, and uh, art making can come together. And in the spirit of no boundaries and questioning this whole idea of divisions that human beings make and the effect it has not only on other human beings but also on species other than ourselves, uh, a local, very gifted photographer named Krista Sklyer, who is the partner of uh, one of my former colleagues at, at, at the agency I worked at, um, has uh, created a book called Continental Divide. And it's a series of photographs, very artfully done, of the ecosystem around the wall that's been going up between Mexico and the United States. Mm -hmm. And she actually documents what happens to animals that try to inhabit the spaces on the two sides. And also just the beauty of the ecosystem but something you said reminded me, and I wanted to find this picture when you were talking. This is just one of the images. There are wild boar trying to feed on the side of the wall. And of course, that's not possible. Um, and she shows other kinds of situations where the ecosystem is just cut in half. But again, a very activist use of art and image making uh, proactively for the environment. And I can pass this around. So while we're on the subject of beyond boundaries, uh, one of my most inspirational uh, finds around art making in the environment and festivals is a group called Rare Conservation. And I actually hadn't known about them, and, and they're very, very effective. They work in the far-flung areas of the globe where communities are very poor, and they live in very fragile ecosystems. So um, Vietnam, Indonesia, um, the Caribbean, um, India, and this guy named Paul Butler back a couple of decades ago was a scientist in the Caribbean trying to save a, a parakeet that was going extinct. And he said, nothing I do, I tell people the information, they don't get it. So he, he created an art and media campaign. And it's very simple, he actually creates mascots of whatever endangered species there is. 
and he creates sort of this fun activity festival around it, and people embody, if you will, that species. They talk on behalf of the species, and it's created a lot of sort of excitement in communities that otherwise would not at all be persuaded by data. And just very quickly, because I don't want to take up too much more time, uh, locally, one of my favorite projects while I was working for the city was the Green DC Map. And it was a project that, that I had a, an opportunity to create and manage. And my thought was that you can't really talk people into saving the environment unless they know that it's there. And so uh, when we did the Green DC Map, you could actually locate yourself in the city and find where all of the ecological innovations are. So you want to take a bird walk, you could find it here on the map. You want to find a cool solar installation site, you can find it on the map. Uh, you want a scenic walk or a community garden you can go to? Are those still available? Yeah, okay. Well, it, it was developed under the previous administration, so this current administration would have to reinvent it in order for it to be distributed again. But, you know, maybe it could be created That's through nonprofits. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's another form of culture making. How do you make visible and how do you engage people with issues where a legal conversation would just make them yawn? And finally, I think I'll close with the Anacostia. These are images uh, by Bruce McNeil, who I've been talking to. He's a photographer and he's been documenting the Anacostia River. Do you know Bruce? Yeah, nice guy. And, um, uh, he has just taken images that show the beauty of the Anacostia and also the condition that it's in. I'm sure you, you guys uh, know each other. And he also evokes historical spirits when he uh, talks about the Anacostia. So uh, he suggests that we have this kind of tradition, cultural tradition of uh, animal spirits and ecological spirits that inhabit the places, including our rivers. So he, if you go back... Um, he, he shows these. And this is a beautiful photograph that's on exhibit at the Anacostia Museum right now, and you can go see it. And if you would go next, Robert. Uh, this is uh, another one that was part of Luminate Anacostia. And the final one, and thank you for uh, This is a, a, an evocation of the river goddess in a very colorful way, talking about um, the history and the needs of the river. And all of the Luminate Anacostia project, which happened last year, um, Bruce and his friends got together and created a very kind of environmentally oriented exhibit. So again, artists really uh, advocating for the river, I think in ways that are much more interesting than if we just you know, had lectures and symposia. And so I'm going to put in a plug for the, Smith, uh, for the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum and that exhibit. I think there are some great examples of art making for the environment. They've got workshops for kids, for adults, um, art making around the river. And I think they've sort of got the right idea. I met with their associate director a few weeks ago, and she said, one of the things I'd love to do is have a festival. And at that festival, I want somebody to create water music performances. Water music. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, oh, I don't know. Artists could figure it out. Who was that? The meeting was with Sharon. I'm so bad with names when I'm in front of people. I can uh, get it. Sharon. Yeah, Sharon? She was on the festival. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I'll leave it at that because I think there are so many kind of open opportunities and possibilities, and I think this is the community of people who could make them happen.